Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Good morning, sir. How you guys doing? Saratoga County is well represented. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Two thirds of the meeting is from Saratoga County. Wow. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but, but John and I commiserate on the on the history the night before of the Mets, and each time we come. To the oh team, well, you guys. They, they actually won last night. They got rained out. Nice. I was going to say <laughs> they didn't play. <laughs> They won some pretty crazy games lately. Boy, that was yes. Oh, did, John, did you watch that one, the Philadelphia one the other night? Was I it, turned it off when I thought it was a home run and didn't realize they overturned the call. Yeah, the home <laughs> run that wasn't a home run and the running outside the bases that – Yeah, on a straight that, line. That was called but wasn't yep. <laughs> running out of the bases. <laughs> it's like, what? what is going on here? And then uh, call them uh, – Calling him out. Oh, yeah, calling him out at first base. He was safe. Oh, right man. after that. Yeah. I know I know the uh true baseball fan or the traditional baseball fan doesn't want to go, doesn't want to have computers making the call. Mm. But you know what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they could do a better job. True. Mm. And and even some of these, you know, strike and ball uh con you know calls. Um yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you all members and participants for joining our May 5th meeting of the Capital District Transportation Committee Planning Committee. Um, hope you're all well. It's an honor and privilege to serve as your chair. Um, so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, Michael has the quorum and our affiliations. Um, first order of business is to open the floor for any visitor issues at this time following our tradition. Uh, uh, governing by consensus for the four counties. Are there any visitors wishing to address the CDTC committee at this time? Going once. Going twice. Turning off my air radio. And uh, we can move to the adoption of our prior meeting minutes of April 7th. Uh, the minutes were uh, distributed uh, both paper and electronically and uh, would entertain a motion to adopt our April 7th minutes, please. I have, a, I have one thing first. If we don't find Saratoga County. Please, please mute your, your microphone if you're not speaking. Okay. Um, I just had one note and it's a, it's a clarification if somebody's picking up the minutes and has a question. On page four, Steve, under uh, uh, DOT's project delivery schedule, uh, it says Greg shared the final project list for this year. Can we just throw in a clarifier and say for this state uh, fiscal year? You can't make like private money public work. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah. The uh, clarification, Michael, is to clarify. Well, we don't want people thinking that um, it within the calendar year or something that that's it you know for great projects so i just put a clip i had the thing the other day i was on the phone with greg and with glenn and uh one of our guys in dpw just went bonkers over what year are we in you know so it's a state fiscal year i believe right bob yeah Steve, it would be the state fiscal year yeah it says 21 22 state 21 fiscal 22. year at the top for region one Right. And I'm just, it just, to, just if you could throw two words in that first sentence in there, that's all. The state fiscal year is clarified. Thank you, Michael. Any other corrections before we vote to uh, memorialize these minutes to go on the website and uh, recorded as permanent? Any other move comments? Their, move for their approval. Thank you, Michael. Second by. Is that Andrew? Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Any abstaining or opposed? Any abstaining or opposed? The minutes are hereby adopted. And we can move forward to item three, the presentation portion. Uh, so we're grateful to have uh, Vice President of Clough Harbor Associates, CHA Consulting, that is Paul McDonald joining us this morning. Uh, topic uh, near and dear to our heart here at the airport is uh, Albany County Airport Authority and International Airport going places. We got a new 
airport master plan. This is our development update and we'll be brief uh, with a slideshow that our consultant expert team uh, has prepared for us. It is an exciting time here at the airport. We're seeing good regional economic indicators with restoration of our pre-pandemic economy. Uh, we're still at about two thirds of the 2019 numbers. Scheduled flight operations used to be in the order of 80 to 100. It's highly dynamic, as you know, um, and carriers are coming back. We've got ultra low fare carrier services. Um, so it is very competitive, it is very dynamic, working in the uh, passenger scheduled uh, travel mode. Cargo has been consistently higher than all prior years, over 10 to 12% over prior years. But uh, we're gonna give you a brief overview of our master plan update. It's been over uh, 20 years since our last airport master plan. It's a challenging time in light of the uh, very unusual or unprecedented uh, 2020 circumstances, but we are seeing good, strong passenger recovery at this time. And uh, can we share the screen with Paul McDonald, who's joined us this morning? Do you have your... Uh, yep, this is Paul McDonald. Paul. Thank you, Paul. This is Paul McDonald. I'm gonna request control to share the screen. <laughs> We've got a few slides to go over. Thank, thank you, Paul. A few points of background where we normally had between 4,500 and 5,000 passengers departing every day as an average in 2019. We're still up in the range of uh, 2,800 to 3,300 today. Our airport authority offices are now moved into the terminal. So we're right here on the third floor. Uh, if you're passing through, feel free to stop and say hello. Um, but it's a very busy time. We're always managing several dozen capital improvement projects ongoing. The master plan will help guide us for the next 20 years, similar to our new visions uh, program. But this is airport specific on aeronautical infrastructure, uh, supporting time critical aircraft movements, both passenger scheduled service and cargo. We are the sole scheduled service airport in the upper Hudson Valley and lower Champlain Valley. Um, closest nearby scheduled service airports to the west would be Syracuse, to the east would be Bradley, to the north would be Plattsburgh, and to the south possibly Stewart and the metro airports of New York City. Um, so hey, Paul's Dave. ready to run through our master plan study overview. Take it away, yeah. Paul. So you see the master plan cover slide right now? Yeah, looks good. Okay, very good. Okay, so the master plan got underway in 2020 under contract. And uh, it, it's a pretty large study overall covering a, a 20 year period. Um, CHA was hired by the airport authority as their consultant uh, to compile the master plan on their behalf. And we also have some other firms um, working with us. One is Jacobson and Daniels, who is a specialty airport planning firm, a small firm, that's all they do. And then we also have a, an architect, a large firm, national firm, Gensler, who is the architect on our planning team. So those are the people behind the scenes. Um, the airport's rebranding, as uh, many of you may already know, and we're gonna be incorporating their rebranding into all our materials for the master plan as we move forward. Um, community outreach is a big part of this overall study. And that was uh, very important to the authority to get input from throughout the community, users and non-users alike. Uh, we have two committees set up just for the planning study. So they're ad hoc committees during the master plan effort. Um, one committee is regional. Um, it includes a lot of the elected officials, the professionals um, in the technical departments in the town of Colony and, and County of Albany, um, and also the regional planning organizations such as this. We have a second committee, which is very technical. It's the tenants of the airport for the most part. FAA, air traffic control, airlines, uh, you name it, they're invited to participate in the study. We're also gonna having uh, periodic public meetings. Um, they may be virtual, they may not be virtual as the, hopefully as, as the study goes on. And we also set up a study website. Um, so the airport has their own airport website. 
but we also have one set up just to share documents and communications and collect comments for the master plan itself. Uh, here's the uh, homepage uh, with a link to the master plan study. Um, if any Google search will find it, if you search Albany Airport master plan, you'll, you'll find the website to the study. And uh, the key point here is that if you're interested in materials, um, draft reports and diagrams, uh, they'll all be contained here on the website for public access under the, the, the study materials tab. And also for uh, general public or um, committee members, uh, there's a way that you can just a contact form where you can submit comments electronically, which is, we always prefer that of course, because then we will never lose it because it will be part of our record. Okay, what's a master plan? Um, you know, it's basically a long-term facility plan, just like for a college campus or any transportation system. Um, it's a physical planning study. Uh, behind the scenes, there are substantial FA guidance and standards that, that Steve and the airport are required to meet. We hope to make that as invisible as possible to the general public. Now, what's more, what's more uh, of an outreach for the community is, is looking at forecasting future aviation demand and uh, extra, extra tough uh, during COVID, but that's a key component of the study that needs to be approved by the FAA. And then other very traditional planning items are included throughout our scope. We're looking to guide the development at the airport, uh, including its modernization. The airport is always looking to promote customer convenience. We're doing this on a short-term basis, mid-term and long-term. And uh, it's FAA policy, they try, they want to get all commercial airports to try and update their master plan every 10 years or as significant things change. We, uh, <clears throat> we always like to recognize Albany as a regional asset. Uh, folks don't often know how important it is to the community as a whole. The data on this slide is now old. It's DOT data. They're updating their analysis statewide. We're hoping to have that. Um, before the end of the master plan, but you know, just very briefly, you know, there's over a hundred public airports in the state. Uh, 18 of those are commercial service and Albany is one of the biggest after the New York City airports and Buffalo. Uh, the state has estimated a, a billion dollars of economic activity to the capital region from Albany airport and all the spinoffs, uh, including over 9,000 jobs. So we're always touting that um, to, to, for folks in the community to know how big of a, a complex and how important it is to the capital district. We do have focus areas for the master plan. Um, being a smart airport for the future, it, the, the airport authority is very interested in modernizing with technology and new safety protocols and, and making it a very easy airport for people to use. One of the key components that the airport continues to work on is the TSA security checkpoint. The airport's been improving that checkpoint for some time already, and that's going to be a, a continuing focus of the airport moving forward. Um, separately, separately from the airline service, the master plan is also looking to improve cargo facilities, corporate aviation facilities, and do a lot of land use planning surrounding the airport. Um, one of the things that the airport struggles with is it's, we call it land poor. It's surrounded by development on all sides. So there's very little new property for new facilities. We'll, we'll be doing a lot of infill planning, uh, maximizing the best use of the airport's property. Energy efficiency and state sustainability is also a component of the master plan. The biggest generator of energy at the airport is the terminal complex. So that's, that's the focus this master plan. We do have a schedule um, getting through the FA process. Uh, you know, it was 18 to 24 months, typically. We're just starting. We're, uh, we're doing the forecast now, working with the FA on that process. Um, so if we ha don't have any reports just yet, um, but the first report we release is going to be the inventory of the forecast chapter, looking at aviation activity, not just next year, but 
20 years down the road. Uh, the elephant in the room, of course, is COVID. Uh, when we started the master plan, COVID has, was already raging. Um, the airline industry is expecting a slow recovery. Uh, but for our forecast period, uh, we're not only looking at airline industry projections, we're also working very closely with the FAA on their projections nationally and locally at Albany Airport. And we're all, we also look at other, other forecasters, bond rating agencies and other economic development companies and authorizations that uh, are all interested on how long it will take to get over COVID. Now, the bad part is no one really knows. <laughs> we have to admit that up front. Um, but the general thinking is two to four years for full recovery. And of course that's you know highly dependent on our herd immunity concept or reaching uh, vaccine levels that people start traveling again. There's two general types of travel coming out of Albany. There's the, the leisure travel, that's coming back first, we believe. People are, are interested in getting out and traveling again and going places. Uh, and then business travel. It's, it's projected that business travel will take longer. Uh, some of it's we've learned how to do business virtually and that, that's really going to suppress the demand, even with the vaccine in hand. Um, so that's a, a general idea of what we're expecting. After four years, after five years, uh, we're going to be projecting some, some growth, but it's going to be modest. Uh, all of the activity growth, restoration, and projections beyond will really have an effect on the terminal planning considerations. And um, when we started scoping the project, this is the first master plan where passenger safety became an issue and part of the, the focus of the study. Okay, just very briefly, um, looking at the facility itself, uh, most people may not even know the airport has two runways. The north-south runway is the main runway, parallels the, the north way. Uh, for interest, it's uh, 8,500 feet long. And then there's the east-west runway. Uh, again, as I said, all the runways tax is in aprons. We hope to make the improvements of that completely invisible to the general public. Uh, that's what the pilots see and the air traffic controllers are involved in, but uh, not generally the flying public. The, the buildings you see, the blue squares, the airport authority owns and operates over 40 buildings in all four quadrants of the airport. Uh, the planning study will cover existing facilities and development in all of those locations throughout the airport property. The, the biggest base of the airport is the terminal complex. There's, there's three concourses, two parking garages now, lots of surface parking, um, a terminal curbside and a roadway system, all, all owned and operated by the airport authority. Um, making this a very convenient um, facility to get in and out of this is a key for the master plan. We, we would argue it already is convenient, um, and the master plan is interested in even improving upon that. Nope. Forecast, this is preliminary now. We haven't released anything yet, and we're still working with the FAA, but um, for general purposes, uh, oh, these numbers no, here the are total passengers. Yeah. So oh, at the Albany Airport, at, uh, yeah. getting a lot of feedback. I don't know if someone. Hey, he's just sitting there waiting for. Oh, he's talking. Oh. He's talking to. Oh. Oh. Okay, that's better. Uh, <clears throat> We generally let measure activity in, in total employments, total passengers boarding an aircraft. That's an, one employment. The airports had about 1.5 million employments in, in the last few years. As you can see on, on the purple line on this graph, 1.5 million. Um, these years are fiscal years. Um, COVID happened in the middle of the fiscal year, so it kind of 
hides the real drop off, but activity went down to almost nothing um, a year ago when COVID first hit. And as Steve explained, um, year over year, been down for 2020 and 2021, um, been down about half. But we are expecting a recovery. Uh, that's about five years out and then potential growth beyond that. You see the growth slow and steady is, is really the highest level of growth we would expect. Nothing um, crazy or substantial. A, a steady growing airport is what we envision. As we get further into the master plan, we'll be looking at all sorts of concepts and development options. For the passenger terminal, even though we're, we're struggling currently in the short term, it's a 20 year plan. We need to look at long-term needs uh, for the airport's modernization and as aircraft change and, and, and get larger is what we're observing now. Uh, we need to have facilities that can accommodate that. In the short term, one of the focus areas is the main entrance to the airport. Uh, we're looking at expanding upon that, um, even to accommodate 2019 numbers. We have peaking congestion problems in the terminal checkpoint area, the area where the, where the bridge over the roadway is, um, where the queuing area is, there's little concessions, not much space for meters and greeters. So that's an initial focus area. Even if we are at 2019 levels again, we still wanna see some expansion and improvements in that one location. So you'll, you'll see that as a concept in the master plan. Going beyond the terminal area, uh, we talk about four quadrants at the airport. This is the north-south runway. The terminal is in the southwest quadrant, but we'll be doing planning for all areas of the airport. And the red line shows um, the airport property as it exists today. Um, concepts we've, we've been looking at early in the process, just sort of a highlight. This is on the northwest quadrant. You can see there's already a lot of development in this, in this quadrant area. We're looking at infill, we're looking at how to maximize space. So the rendering on the right is just one potential idea of uh, upgaging the existing facilities to accommodate um, airline service aircraft, potential cargo activities and the like. Um, moving over to now we're on the Southeast quadrant. This is one of, one of the few locations of open space on the airport, about 10 acres. And the, the rendering on the right is just one potential concept of, of maximizing corporate aviation development in that area. So just one potential option. We'll, we'll be refining these and uh, making alternatives and, and considering all the local issues, including environmental. Land use planning. We're also incorporating that into the airport. As I said, the property of the airport is very tight, not a lot of open space. There's wetlands, there's private property, there's town and other public property surrounding the airport. And we'll be looking at planning that out in the future. Are there parcels that the airport authority should be acquiring? Um, how should they redevelop their existing property on the airport? So all of that's part of the master plan. Um, in addition to the airline service and the parking activity that we're all familiar with at the airport, Land use planning and other types of development uh, help with revenue diversification. That's one of the components of the master plan. As well. So last but not least, um, that's kind of our overview, but I uh, want to highlight that uh, the overall study question is, what does Albany International Airport look like in 10 and 20 years down the line? And that's uh, to be determined over the next 12 months. Great overview, Paul. Thank you very much. We'll open it to Q&A. Thanks for keeping a nice short executive summary overview of our current vision, uh, uh, visioning efforts looking forward the next 20 years. Uh, we do believe we'll continue to see economic restoration of uh, employments are departing passengers. So the 1.5 employments equals 3 million ticketed passengers in 2019. We think we'll be back there within the two years as uh, Paul indicated, uh, 
This is 21, that would be 23, 24. And the FAA is also taking a hard look at this, 24, 25. But we do see restoration every day. Lines are back at the checkpoint. Um, there's a lot of demand for uh, commercial aviation, both um, scheduled and non-scheduled um, corporate with global foundry expansion and other GE, R&D, and all the academic institutions in the area. We're proud to be a technological leader. We're only one of four airports in the world that have both GABC, um, GBAC, uh, and Airport Council International accreditation for uh, excellent hygiene at this time. Um, so we're clean and green, and it's still the safest mode of interregional mass transit as, as just a, a high point. Our area is about 46th largest metropolitan area. And our airport's ranked about 80th now, Paul, in the national system of 4,000 airports in the US. Yeah, that's about right. Roughly. Yep. So we are ahead of Syracuse and Rochester, uh, just slightly behind Buffalo. Uh, so largest airport upstate and larger than Islip on Long Island also. The only larger airports in, in New York are Buffalo with Toronto traffic and uh, LaGuardia uh, being a domestic hub and JFK for international service, of course. So we open it to questions and answer. Uh, we appreciate your input throughout our master plan process. We saw some of you at our technical meetings in February and, and uh, we'll be having another uh, regional and technical series of public meetings this uh, early July before the track starts up. So that's our plan moving forward this year is to continue good public input uh, through our master plan website and through the meetings, both uh, in-person meetings and combination of uh, Zoom. The Zoom went fairly well back in February, but I think we're ready to resume um, public meetings with social distancing and uh, masks uh, and so on. But uh, open any questions to the floor, it's about 10 o'clock. Steve, I think Ross Farrell has a question. Ross? Well, thanks. Thanks, Steve. And, and thanks, Paul. This is a great presentation. And it's exciting to see that, you know, that you're starting to look at the long-term vision for the airport. Um, two, two questions. Uh, first is, well, I guess more of a, a comment. So CDTA, we'll be talking about this in the coming months, is going to be doing a BRT expansion study. Um, that's looking at, all right, move, moving beyond just the three lines, the, the purple line, red line, and the blue line, and what would be the yellow line, green line, and orange line, let's say. Um, and, and part of that is going to be looking at, you know, what improvements we can make to, to major generators and um, whether, you know, we bring a BRT to the airport or not, I, I don't know. We'll figure that out in the study, but the connections to um, the airport from our micro transit or regular route service to the BRTs are, are gonna be critical. So um, I'm glad the two studies are kind of happening in, in conjunction at the same time because we'll be able to work off each other. Um, one question I had is, is this study including an update to your origin destination of, well, we, we know the destination is obviously the airport, um, but where, travelers to the airport are coming from because i'd imagine with the downturn and then sort of the, the bounce back the where people are coming from to the airport is going to change and so is this study going to try to look at that at least map out the best we can of where people are coming from when they're getting going to the airport steve you want me to jump in yeah jump in paul go go yeah. ahead it not that specifically in this study, being uh, mostly a physical plan for the FAA and for the, the airport's future development. We are looking at overall activity and um, the demands put on the facility. Um, it's such, that's a slightly different question about an, an air service study in the, doing an O&D model and, and doing a, a delivery of airline type services and destinations. The authority does their air service planning separately from the physical master plan. Um, but um, Steve, I don't know if you wanted to add anything because I, I know you do have efforts to expand service with, with many of your carriers and have been successful in bringing in some of the, the non-national players like uh, Jeff, Jeff Blue and others. Sorry, I'll jump in real quick, Paul. I meant origin destinations within the reach. So, um, oh. 
the individuals when they leave their house in a colony or wherever. That's what I meant. Not not from flying in Understood. here. Traveling Understood. Through. Understood. I, we, we don't have that as part of the scope. We are doing terminal curbside planning to make sure the total usage and capacity of the curbside is adequate. Um, but once they go leave beyond the airport boundaries, um, that's the study of O and D is not in our, our current plan. Okay, understood. Um, and the second question actually does maybe started to answer it, which was, and this is maybe a general question, and I apologize if it's not tied to the, to the study itself, but um, we've been having a lot of conversations re recently with uh, uh, CBRE um, that's just more talking about in the sense of regional economic development. Finally, understood the importance of uh, you know making more connections to the region from new destinations uh, throughout throughout honestly the, the, the North America. What what do we now this group the planning committee or the, the region do we provide anything that helps subsidize and encourage uh, additional flights coming in from new destinations? Uh, that is definitely a, a huge factor in if companies would like to relocate or have part of their company relocate to a region is the how easy the air travel is. So I, I just I'm sorry, general question, but I don't know if that's the key. But do we subsidize anything now? And is it something we want to talk about in the future? Yeah, correct me, Paul, if I sidestep this at all, but um, the two points, Russ, are, are very well taken. Back in the 90s, I, I did a patron survey to, to get the specifics on where in our uh, region the patrons were, terminal patrons were coming from. Uh, if ticketed passengers are 3 million a year in 2019, that would mean terminal patrons are, are double that. Meters and greeters um, typically double the number. And I did a survey with college students. We had 10 students and, and we got a handle at that time on the breakdown of uh, origin in the region to the airport and also mode of uh, transport to the airport. And, and I would, as airport planner, support a renewal of that patron survey. It is separate from the MP scope, master plan scope. Now on your question of air service development, I have to defer to Matt Cannon, is our staff dedicated to air service development. He's got some new initiatives. We've got a new flight I just announced to Nashville direct. Uh, it's highly dynamic, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks on the carrier mix, aircraft mix, uh, carriers come, carriers go. I remember Braniff, People's Express, and TWA, and Northwest, and so many other carriers were scheduled carriers here at Albany, even going back to my youth here, uh, Mohawk and Allegheny. Um, Anyway, I'm digressing, but so that is an area for Matt Cannon to address. And to answer your other question on financial subsidies, there is a congressional uh, separate program from what I work in, airport improvement funding called Essential Air Service that does support all the North Country airports service to small hubs like Albany. Uh, and there are other economic incentive opportunities, which Albany is actively participating in. So I hope I answered your question on those three questions that were intermeshed, Ross. Anything further on that? No, thank you, Steve. Good. Okay. Yeah, Matt Cannon, I'll get back to you uh, with specifics on that. I'll, I'll send you his number. Any, anyone else like to uh, hear any detailed responses on anything we showed? Um, airports are like small cities. In planner terms, we're edge city. We're right in the centroid, the geographic center of our metropolitan area. Uh, on population, uh, still got some wildlife issues. There's still a herd of deer running up and down Shaker Creek or along the North Way, but the development pressure has been on for decades. And we're right in the center, the centroid of our geographic region, um, center of the town of Colony, and also the center of our, our metropolitan uh, consolidated area, uh, ranked as 46th in the country. We had a question? This is uh, Chris in Schenectady. Thanks, Chris. How are you doing? I have a I have a question for you. I guess this is does does the airport as an authority uh, do they have any kind of guidelines or concerns when it comes to revenues? You know, if you're if you're talking about development and you're looking at that they had that slide where you're showing infield development for hangars and future growth, 
does does that does that look good on your report card if you have additional revenue to the airport or is that a goal or is it to or is it really you know a highly subsidized industry where it's okay but you know i don't know how, to, how does your balance sheet shape out when you're trying to decide who gets this valuable space inside your city federally governed very strictly uh, governed uh, Aviation is the most strictly regulated mode of, of travel I've learned over many decades here. Um, everything is pursuant to FAA. There's no diversion of revenue allowed. Everything needs to be competitively bid. Um, and everything's under a microscope. And we live with single annual auditors, Chris. Uh, the single annual audit goes through every line of our annual budget, uh, procurement and expenditure. Uh, DOT, I'm sure, has similar uh, audit controls on the highway side, but on the aviation side, Federal Aviation Administration is very stringent in all aspects. Our mission is to preserve and enhance airport safety and capacity and expand competitive opportunities for the aviation industry and in support of the air traveling public, both passenger and cargo. Um, so development needs to be aeronautical. We're not, we're not here to promote non-aeronautical development. Um, we also wanna keep things on an even playing field with in the town of Colony tax base um, for remote parcels in the runway approach areas, for instance, um, those would need to be kept on the tax rolls and we work closely with our municipality town of Colony in that regard. And it's only aeronautical uh, parcels that have the aeronautical exemption from uh, full value taxation assessment but we are an uh, international port of entry. We have US Customs here, as you know. Um, so that's our mission is to preserve and enhance the safety and capacity of international air traveling public. We used to have Air Canada, I hope to see them come back, but many charter operations here going flying direct to Cancun and Costa Rica, other points. Um, progress in that area, all Southwest staff are now passport holding and, and the indicators are that Southwest will commence um, some form of international service, probably starting with expanded, and they have existing Caribbean um, destinations and uh, possibly go to England. So that, that's hopeful, long range um, yeah. planner's view on development and expansion. Chris, did I hit, did I hit your question adequately? Yeah, uh, that, was, that was good. I just, I just wanted to know how that worked. Yeah, yeah from, uh, we're under order of microscope. Yeah, thank you. From a planning standpoint, physical planning standpoint, what the master plan will do directly is like we talked about forecasts, but we're also forecasting not just airline service, corporate service, cargo activity, even military activity. And the master plan list looks at all the available space, does a forecast for the demands, short term and long term. And then our task is to reserve space to accommodate each of those potentially competing activities at the airport and make recommendations to the authority about how to plan and reserve that space. For the development itself, other than the terminal building, most of the development is funded privately by a new corporation or air, air cargo operator. So we'll be mixing that within the planning study and laying it out um, for over the long term. Our airport's relatively land poor, I might mention. I did a study of all airports in New York State and found 20 other airports have more land than Albany. Most of them are all smaller than Albany. We have about 1,200 acres um, in our jurisdiction at this time. All right, any one last question? It's 1010. We should probably move on with our other regional issues. Uh, we have a full agenda. One last question. Thank you for your... Uh, Steve, this uh, is Bob. May I... A quick one. I, I know uh, with with these the expansion considerations that uh, your, your proximity to to groundwater and and sort of containing water used on the property is there. I mean, is that part of the facility expansion plans? Yes. For Paul McDonald chiming in, uh, it, yes, but not from an engineering standpoint. You know. The, the airfield has over 100 acres of pavement just for the runways and taxiways. 
and the airport's flat and St Steve knows and many others, it, it doesn't drain well. The airport's been in trying to improve outfalls and, and surface water drainage. And when we do the layout planning, uh, we'll be looking at if you develop this facility here, where are you gonna send the storm water? Uh, so it'll stop short of hydrological modeling but it is a question that we will incorporate into the master plan is the stormwater, groundwater. Uh, we did uh, just this past year complete a $1.9 million airfield drainage improvement. Both uh, there was a drainage study prior to that. Uh, and then this was uh, almost 2 million in drainage improvements uh, to assure that we don't become a lake uh, when we see extreme weather come in during the Hurricane Irene and Lee back-to-back -back storms. I believe we got uh, 18 inches of rain, if I remember correctly. Um, all taxiways and runways, and aeronautical movement surfaces remained above water. And we kept our buildings dry, but everything else turned into a lake uh, is the way things worked here. Um, did I answer your question, Bob, or do you have more oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I know from the tour you gave us, I, I mean, you've, you've got some impref impressive reclamation efforts for your water use over there. I, I just, I'm certain that plays into any sort of future plans uh, as well. But oh, no. that project of mine, let me touch on it very briefly. We got the US EPA Environmental Quality Award for our anaerobic fluidized bed treatment of uh, de-icing stormwater. As you know, aircraft need to be de-iced from October through May. We're still in de-icing season, as warm as it's been. And we have the award winning best available technology still today. I think that's what you're referring to, Bob, uh, for the 64 acres of containment collection for on-airport treatment and disposal. And we're a world leader among airports for the most cost-effective means of treating de-icing stormwater, actually creating drinking water quality, Class A water, going into a Class C stream, Shaker Creek going to the Mohawk River, which becomes drinking water. So on water quality issues and on air quality issues, we're very proud of our environmental record um, being the first in the state with um, clean American fuel vehicles and compressed natural gas station. Now we're promoting electric vehicle charging stations. We just opened another 10 stations. We're up to 16 stations. Soon we'll have 26 electric vehicle stations. We also have uh, scheduled carriers with electric tugs and loaders. Um, so we're promoting clean air, clean water, an excellent uh, leadership role in environmental management among the regional transit facilities. So is that okay as the last question? We answer you, Bob, adequately? Oh yeah, Steve, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, tour is welcome anytime. Thank you, thank you for your interest. And, and uh, the offer for a tour stands. Uh, please call me directly if we can host you or a group for tours of our facilities. I would be grateful to support that. All right, thanks, Paul. Great overview. And thank you everyone for your interest in our master plan. And thanks for your participation in that. Getting back to our planning committee agenda item four is the action item for fiscal constraint discussion. This is a continuing running story on the tip summary. Table four has been updated again, and we're showing a balanced five year program, I believe. Michael, uh, you're going to start us on item four? Yes. So currently, uh, this what's what I shared on the screen is the uh, current fiscal constraint table, table four. You'll notice that uh, in the second year and the third year, we're over the the five percent uh, that FHWA uh, recommends and prefers that we we stay under that five percent total. So uh, to show you that our, our that is the issue with, that we're trying to deal with. So. Uh, what we'd like to do is make an adjustment to that so that um, we are no longer over the 5%. Give me a chance to share my screen here. Um, Is anyone from Federal Highway Administration on our meeting? No, not right now. This is a key area of their interest. And I always like to ask what's our latest correspondence or dialogue with Federal Highway Administration? So what we have here is just in, in, a, in your package, a proposal to uh, make some 
changes to our budget estimates. Uh, these need to be approved by the planning committee. Uh, we worked with DOT to come up with these estimates. We've done these before, um, but it's, it's necessary this time just so that we could stay under the 5%. Uh, so we're looking to move uh, NHPP funding, uh, $3 million uh, mm. um, from the current, from the- uh, uh, 2021. Right, from 2021 to the proposed budget estimate. So it's, it's from 2021 to 2022 to 2021, the $3 million. Mike, um, can I throw out a question? I'm just wondering, like you said, we have done this before and it's probably questions. Are real, real projects affected in this change? I mean, are you working with sponsors when you do a decrease? Well, well, actually, some of the real projects are the reason for the changes because we've had some deferments where we've tried to move projects actually back into the current fiscal year uh, by the request of the sponsor. So, you know, we'd like to do those, obviously, and with the sponsor's approval and DOT's approval, we did that, but that was in doing that, we, we did affect the, the fiscal constraints. So these these changes are really are really the result of being responsive to the sponsors' needs at this point. All right. If we look at the second chart, which shows that um, that change, that goes we go from a 5.4 overage in 2021, and we go to a 1.6 percent overage. Now that's that's a lot in just aggregate dollars there. A significant decrease. Now we've got five months left to this fiscal year. Do we look at this as saying, okay, we, we'll come back each month and and uh, adjust this as we go, or are we going to are we going to get caught in a point where we're pinched? Mike, are you referring to the new the new proposed table four that I just shared? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So. Uh, that's a difficult question to ask. I don't think we're going to be in a, in a, in a situation where we're going to have to do this on a regular basis. Uh, I think this is the second time this year that we've adjusted the budget es estimates. Um, well, I'm assuming NHPP was, that was chosen just because of the, um, the great percentage overage and the, and the budget estimate available to move around. Is that correct? Yeah, Mike, this is Greg, I guess. I can help chime in here too. Um, you know, before the fiscal year started, we moved. At, you know, we asked everybody to please help move projects out that have a right. any risk of not being delivered for the stiff performance thing. And when we did that, we moved a bunch of money with them. So if sponsors are requesting phases or whatnot come back in, mm -hmm. we need to bring some money back with it. And rather than bring out you can't do it project by project. If someone wants 200,000, you can't just bring back 200,000. You got to kind of do a bunch of moves and then line your money up later. We tried to bring in some excess money so that there's more room for more small changes to happen um, before we run into the 5% again. And, okay. Uh, and that you five months. Yeah. You hit on that because you did make, you said, okay, making some small changes. And that's what I'm saying. Okay, we've got five months to go. Then really all we can afford to do, particularly in that one category, is just maybe do, you know, small adjustments to take us into September. Um, and that was, that's what I was looking at. I just didn't know if that, that obviously that's a, that's a very, very popular category, fund source. I just didn't know if there was going to wind up being a constraint on that by knocking that one down so much in this move this time the, the constraints on the total dollars so the the year mm -hmm. fund sources vary a lot year by year there's it's impossible to keep those perfect so the, the total is what you look at really okay thank you yeah that, just a just a comment though i mean this used to never occur but you know we've had this uh, kind of a conflicting requirements from the federal government where we have a performance measure that you know is that requires us to make sure that we program projects in the year that they're funded and that they actually get occurred during that 
programmed year. So that's the performance measure we're dealing with. And to do that, we've had to move projects in and out of their proposed year. But then on the other side, we have this fiscal, fiscal constraint requirement, which keeps us under 5%. So in the, in the past, we would never do this. We would never make these changes. Uh, probably would make the changes mostly during a tip update like every two or three years. Mm -hmm. But we're in this situation now with these, and I call them conflicting requirements from the federal government that we have to make these changes to comply with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's unfortunate. It's it's kind of a paperwork exercise in my personal opinion, but uh, I'm speaking too much now. That's just the way it is. Okay. All right, thank you. Best efforts noted and federal <laughs> guidance is always evolving. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So we need a motion, Steve, to approve the uh, change in the budget estimates that I showed, showed pre previously. Motion, please. I move that. Thank you, Michael. Second by. I'll second it. Thank you, Chris Wallen. All in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Anyone abstaining or opposed? Speak up now. One once, twice. Motion carries, item four. Thank you, Michael. DOT, Greg, and Bob. Next item five is the TIP program amendments. Uh, we've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way up to J. Uh, do we want to combine any of these or individually? Alpha is um, Schenectady 264, state pin 1525.39 is Interstate 890 over Erie Boulevard and Broadway, element specific repairs. And DOT will do an overview. Is it Bob? Right. Yeah, I, th I think I'll I'll take the tip amendments. Uh, the, the, each three of these are going to have to go individually. They're totally separate um, in handling, so it's best just take them one at a time. Thank you. Um, this project is the, the 890, essentially the viaduct over Broadway and Erie Boulevard. It leads into the big circle. There is no more little circle. Um, you know, we've been, had this on the program for a while. The bridge is one of the last bridges with the high rocker bearings that are outdated and need to be replaced with modern bearings. And as the project designs nearing completion, we realize we're the volume of repairs and the, the high, you know, the height of this bridge over the surface is uh, the jacking costs are going to be are anticipated to be pretty high. So in the end, we came in about 2.8 million over our uh, original estimate. So we're requesting a TIP amendment to increase construction and CI accordingly to uh, um, get this ready for letting. It's gonna let this fall. So we, this has to go to policy. So we'd like to get this approved, go to June policy ahead of a, a summer, uh, summer PSE package. Um, we are providing a offset, which I'll discuss in item C. So I'm just, in the interest of simplicity, we'll just take this one at a time, but we did manage to find an offset. So um, yeah, because because 2.8 million is a hefty ask. So we wanted to balance the program. Any questions for us on this? Is it 2.68 or 2.8? Uh, round numbers. It took by I think it's a 2.68 increase. Ed. That's it's on our agenda. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? 21% change. Motion to approve item 5A. Motion. I'll move it, Steve. Steve Feeney. Thank you, Steve. Second by. I'll second. Thank you, Chris. All in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Any abstaining or opposed? Please speak up now. Going once, going twice. 5A is hereby adopted. Thank you. Item 5B is uh, Saratoga 334 on the tip, pin 1722.74, Sitterly Road over the Northway 87 bridge replacement. Uh, this also goes to the policy board, cost increase of about. 9.45, 1.03 is state. Uh, Greg, you want to continue overview? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mike, I, I'm going to, as, as the tip amendment here, 
we summarized you know, nearly nine and a half million is uh, to replace Surly Road, which, as we all know, made the news recently when it was struck by an overheight vehicle, which is a, essentially a man lift on a trailer that was not properly loaded to clear <laughs> up height. Uh, that, um, that vehicle struck the bridge in, in the fashion that is essentially a very heavy multi-ton battering ram the, the way it was configured on the trailer. Um, I'm going to request to share my screen to just show the magnitude. Uh, I made, Greg, I made you co-host. You should be able to. All right. So, perfect. Fantastic. Um, hmm. So this illustrates wow. the damage from the ground. Like you see the pictures in the paper and you're like, wow, it really got that first beam. This vehicle managed to damage four of the five beams carrying Surly Road. Um, first beam obviously was torn. The second beam you see here was deflected in over 18 inches. Um, slideshow. The third beam was deflected well over a foot. And the fourth beam, I don't have a great picture of that one, so it's hard to see. The, the fourth beam was deflected in about six inches. So only one beam was undamaged. Um, here's a view straight up of the torn beam, which really just shows the, the magnitude of what happened here. Um, hmm. You know, this, this, is, uh, this is a very unique bridge hit. Usually bridges win, and trucks lose. In this case, it was a high. Um, so we estimated the cost to fix this under the emergency would be nearly half the cost to replace the entire Sidderley Road, the entire length. So the replacement project will bring Sidderley Road up to 16 feet, which is the new standard over interstates. Um, so hopefully it'll prevent any future hits and the other layer to this is we are getting this funded from the main office pot to given the emergency nature, we couldn't figure out how to reshuffle the regional targets. So the main office is obliged and funding this uh, to get it going quickly. We're targeting a August PS and E package, I believe to let this in um, in the fall so that the, contractor can procure steel and get going first thing in the spring. In the interim, a temporary bridge is being installed now. The temporary bridge is in place and they're building the ramps right now to get Sidderley reopened until we close it again next year for the construction. But we didn't want to leave it closed for the entire 12 to 14 months to get to a new new bridge. So, so that's um, that's the Long and the short of the Citadel Road uh, bridge replacement. Are there any questions for us on this? This is uh, it's made for interesting times around our uh, office. Hmm. When was the detour in place? A couple of days, wasn't it? Or more than a couple of days? Oh, the, the north way was closed for, I believe, a day and a half until they got some supports under it. And then it was open to two lanes because the supports were in the travel lane, in the right travel lane. And then they... Uh, that weekend, they pulled the span out to reopen the Northway, and uh, Sitterly still remains closed right now, but they're working feverishly to build the ramps up to the temporary structure that's sitting there now. Greg, this is Andrew. What's the, um, any kind of insurance on the part of the carrier that struck it that'll compensate the cost? I believe you would call that insurance now canceled. No. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, we have a, obviously a, an accident claims recovery section that will be seeking reimbursement for uh, at least the emergency repairs, I would assume. I don't know the magnitude that we'll collect on this, but, you know, obviously mm -hmm. with, with any bridge hit, we do recoup costs related to cleanup and traffic control and things. So this one's uh, 
one's going to be interesting. Hey, Greg, this is Joe, Joe Cimino. Do, is it's a matter of interest? Does that uh, also expand to economic loss, development, and all that stuff? And maybe it's getting out of your league here with legal stuff, but I wonder with the bridge closed and all the people having to detour, there's, the, there's those costs, and then there's just economic costs of, of this incident. And I just, I'm just astounded that these things happen with all the technology now. And if I'm, if I'm driving that truck or in, I'm that company and I'm driving on the Northway, which is not a back road, I, I, you know, how does, did they claim that this, um, they, they thought they were under it or that they just didn't know, or it just, just kind of befuddles me. Uh, that uh, vehicle, I mean, normal a normal bridge height is considered 14 feet the interstate is 16 feet as a an old strategic military route so in, interstates are supposed to certain certain interstates are supposed to get to 16 feet you know from the concept that the interstate system is a military strategic facility even though it obviously not it's going to be needed but uh so it's put, it, he should have been below 14 feet and or even probably lower than that, I believe. So uh, it was a clear non-measured load. And, you know, that, I mean, that's to, long. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Joe, to your point, though, I, I mean, the, the damages sought would be the more direct damages, the cost. But, uh, you know, like Greg was saying, what the repair costs would be. I mean, it's certainly going to be a multi-million dollar uh, sought against uh, the company and their insurer. The indirect costs, I mean, I, that it's certainly not prohibitive that somebody could seek action against the company or, or their insurer, but that's that's generally not our focus area. Not a DOT focus, yeah. You know, I, I, the other thing that's worth mentioning about this, I mean, we're going to take the opportunity when this temporary bridge is taken out, there is going to be another couple month closure again as they start to construct the new one. And we're going to take the opportunity and... and uh, working with CDTC staff to uh, get a bunch of traffic counts done. It's not kind of a unique scenario that a, a major link in, in the network is taken out and uh, we'll hit it with some traffic counts to sort of do some uh, assumption testing related to the trip distribution when you, uh, uh, when you actually have a link close as opposed to theoretically having one close and what it would do to the model. So we're going to take that opportunity uh, coming up here as well. This is, this is Adam uh, Yagelski. I two questions. One um, was this a permitted uh, OSOW vehicle? And then the second question um, is what was the original uh, life cycle? You know, when was this originally scheduled to be replaced? Uh, this bridge. How, how many years are we moving it up? Well. Actually, I, so to, to your first question, this vehicle was supposed to be a standard height, standard width vehicle. Uh, I don't believe it was permitted as over either dimension. Uh, you know, it's a pretty standard piece of equipment that should normally be properly placed on the trailer. Uh, the, so ironically, we had just let a contract a multi-site bridge contract. It's our normal bridge preservation strategy. And Sitterly Road was contained in that contract mm -hmm. to do some repairs of joints and concrete and a couple little things to uh, honestly extend the life of the bridge for another 20 years. Uh, that project is now not being awarded so we can pull the work out and relet the, that multi-site contract without Sitterly Road in it now. So we, we had no near term or even medium term plan to replace this until it was hit. This is, this is a very unique bridge hit. You know, we, it's rare that this much damage is done. I, in my time, we've even statewide, I don't think we've seen something like this in recent history. Well, and some of those inner beams were deflected more than the initial hit, you know, guys. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, the first beam was torn, but then the other beams were deflected quite a bit. So it, it, it was, it was eye opening to see what was done. Hey, Greg, getting back to your tip amendment, 
Um, is this for just the new superstructure or are you replacing everything? I see that you're talking about clearances in here. Are, are we just replacing the superstructure? We're, we're, it, it is going to be an entirely new bridge end to end over both north and southbound uh, because we, we want to get it up to the 16 feet. If we're going to invest in this much money, we need to meet the standard of 16 feet. So it's going to be an entirely new structure. Siddeley Road's profile is going to change accordingly. Um, you know, so are, are we adding bike lanes and all that kind of stuff, all that good stuff? We are definitely going to build a structure that meets the future comprehensive plan of Clifton Park and Half Moon here. Uh, Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, Steve, just want to mention DOT has been excellent with communicating with the town of Clifton Park. Uh, one of the things that they did initially was just to reach out and see what our comp plans contain. So we did uh, forward to the engineers copies of the Route 470 corridor study done with the town of Half Moon and uh, town center plan. Uh, that were both supported with linkages studies from CDTC. So we appreciate all the uh, support that DOT and the communications that they've had with the local community through this. Thank you for that, John. Very good. Final thoughts before we vote? Everyone's comfortable? I'll move it as chair. May I have a second, please? I'll second. John, thank you. All in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank you. Anyone abstaining or opposed, please speak up now. Go once, go twice. Item 5B is hereby adopted by the CTC Planning Committee. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a very important project. All right, 5 Charlie is S260, pin 111.41 is US 20 over the Schoharie Creek element specific repairs. Again, DOT will provide the overview. Is it Greg again or Bob? Yeah, um, th this one's pretty straightforward. It, basically, we um, through structures and main office asset management and balancing the program, uh, we were obviously with the cost increase on I-90, we were shopping around for an offset and we managed to get this committed to a main office funding pot to help keep us balanced. Um, and so we have to bring the planning committee to show that this was, was funded from our core program, but is now funded off the New York state, statewide, uh, you know, no longer count against regional targets. So uh, basically this provides balance to fiscal constraint uh, with the I-890 tip amendment. Um, that's it. Uh, very, very straightforward. No other change in the project. It's still moving forward as is. So, very well. Good. Well presented. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Greg on this uh, deduct of two point seven eight eight million um, deduct change in the funding um, in the interest of uh, balancing? Any other questions before we vote? Motion to adopt, please. Bye. Yeah, I'll move it, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Steve. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Second bye. I'll second that. That was Joe. It was Adam. Joe. Or Ad Adam Yigelski seconded. Thank you. It's all in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Thank you. Aye. 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 Any abstaining or opposed? Going once, going twice. The 5C deduct is hereby adopted by the committee. Five D Delta is project um, T6B pin 1820.37 star bus replacement and expansion. And Russ Farrell can guide us on the overview. Russ, are you ready? And talk us through your, uh, it's a small D Delta it looks like, right? I'll pass these off. If we might want to do them all as one, uh, one action. We've done that in the past. I'm going to pass this off to Melissa. Um, but this is what we do every May after CDTA adopts its budget in April. Um, all of these items are items that are subsidized or have federal money uh, connected to them. So we have to put them all on the tip. Um, 
And so this is just a standard practice that we do each year when CDPA adopts its budget, then we bring these items to uh, CDPC to have them uh, on the set. Uh, so with that, I'll just pass it off, Melissa, for you to get the background. Thanks, Ross. Um, so basically, just like Ross said, each year we are appropriated formula funds from 5339 and 5307. And uh, the tip had, you know, set up in advance, kind of estimated how we're going to break that down between the projects. And um, when we receive our appropriation in, I think it was late January this year, um, then we adjust our projects uh, to correspond to the funding as it was allocated. And so these are just um, aligning the projects based on the funding this year. Um, one thing to note is we did not, um, there was no funding this year for um, Saratoga in 5339. So we had to make that adjustment. Um, but in general, this is basically just um, shifting funds between the different projects to um, align them with the plan. The only new project this year is um, we are retrofitting our, our buses, the existing fleet with a UV disinfecting system, just as a COVID precaution um, to keep our riders safer. Um, and this is something going forward that will not, um, should not need to be continue on the tip because this will just be part of our standard bus build going forward. This is just to get our existing fleet um, updated to include this technology. So um, any questions? Thank you, Melissa. So we're reviewing how many multiple items now we're talking about. The star buses is item 5D on our agenda. Also E, Seven of them. facility improvements. Also F, transit operations support for Saratoga service. G, golf is transit support vehicles. H is transit bus replacement. I is preventive maintenance. And J, Juliet is the disinfecting system we closed with. Each of these. So it's seven total. Yeah, what's the overall aggregate if we're doing these uh, items? One, two, one point eight seven nine. Five, six, seven. So it's seven agenda items for a, a net add of one point yeah, seven. Right here. Three point four one six increase and a one point five three seven decrease. So the net is is 1.879. Ross you. put me on his payroll for half an hour. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Learn something new every day. All right. Other better questions in mind? Thank you. So we're doing all seven items together as a single action. So we can discuss all seven items, D through uh, okay, Julia. Delta through Juliet. Is it uncomfortable voting on the seven items together? We could back it off and discuss anything individual. Committee's privilege or committee's preference. Is everyone comfortable on the seven items jointly? Yes. I'll go to the, yes. Yes. Good. If anyone's opposed to doing the seven jointly, please speak up. All right. We're going to vote on all seven items. Item. 5D Delta through 5J Juliet. Uh, it's time for discussion. Um, yeah, UV. We use a lot of UV on our uh, escalator handrails and all that. There's other methods of UV disinfecting. We're going to touch those buttons on our elevators. Any, anything else on the pandemic response relating, Russ? How's ridership overall? We can get that in a later status update if you want. I'll give that. that. Let's, yeah, let's go. Through this, but I'll, I'll give an update uh, for everybody on that. Yeah, on the update section. All right. So, on the seven specific items, is everyone comfortable moving forward with a motion and a vote at this time? Is there any further discussion? I have one question. I, I don't, that cover letter that you're showing on the screen, I don't see it in the package unless I missed it. It is the April 21st letter, it follows the DOT Surly Road stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. It is, 
I do. I see it, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, it was sent out both uh, yep. on paper and online. Uh, commend the staff again for excellent outreach and communication. Oh, I got members. it. Yep, thank you. So, yeah, we're, our purpose is to review and discuss and to fully vet each of these fiscal items. Um, uh, it's pretty well presented by the CTA staff, Ross and Melissa. So at, at the bottom, this is Adam, um, at the bottom of that letter, it says CDTA is required to submit federal grant applications in June. Um, so we're requesting a TIP update. So does that, and, and forgive me any naivete or under, lack of understanding here, I, does that mean that um, the, this, this is a, a precursor or requirement in order for CDTA to get the funds to apply for the grant funds through FTA? Yes, we, um, we need to include a copy of the TIP and STIP updated to align with the funds we're requesting in the grant application. So this is just standard with FTA. Okay, thank you. Mandatory prerequisite. Any other questions? Hey, I'll move it, Steve. The, I'll move the proposed fund source changes by C, as presented by CDTA. Thanks, Steve. Second. Thank you very much. And a second to Steve's motion. I got it. Thank Mike. you, Michael. Ready to vote. All in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Aye. And any abstaining or opposed, please speak up now. And the seven items, 5D through 5J, all relating to mass transit uh, improvements and pandemic response. Going once, going twice. These seven items, 5D through J, are hereby adopted. Thank you very much. We move into unified work program, item six on our agenda. Michael? Okay. Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to unmute. Thank you. Uh, so every six months, uh, we're required to submit a progress report to the federal, uh, our federal authorities, the FHWA and FTA. Uh, this is our progress report as it shows on the screen for October of last year to March 31st of this year. Of course, these are federal fiscal years. So this is the second half of the previous federal fiscal year. And, um, You've seen these before. The, what happens is we have to detail each progress on every one of our tasks, but we focus on the uh, summary of key accomplishments uh, during the meeting here. So just a quick review. We've done a few things that we wanted to mention in, in, the, in the key accomplishments. Uh, the second bullet there is something we're really proud of where we're uh, not just you know, sitting on our laurels when it comes to New Visions 2050, we're actually, you know, on a regular, our long range plan, we're actually have this virtual learning series where we're trying to educate our members about New Visions 2050 and making sure that they know as much as possible about the long range plan so that they can help implement all the uh, requirements, recommendations and issues that are associated with that long range plan. So we're continuing this virtual learning series. It's the first time we've done this for a long range plan. And um, if you haven't, I recommend, you know, picking a monthly uh, uh, learning series and, and listening in. They're very interesting. We have a, usually have uh, not just staff, but local governments and other agencies that are reporting on it. So it's it's a really nice panel discussion about the issue that that uh, is is being discussed that month. Um, third bullet down there, we talked about our public participation plan and policy. This is really important, is especially important during the pandemic year where we had to make some quick adjustments to uh, make sure that the public was still able to participate in the process. Uh, that's a federal requirement. We, we take that seriously. So uh, staff did a great job of updating that plan during the long range plan update and coming up with really innovative ways to uh, virtually meet and contact and get input and obtain input from our uh, from the public and our members. So <clears throat> we updated that plan. It's interesting, all the MPOs in New York State are working on this now. Uh, some of them are struggling a little bit with ideas and how to do it. Uh, we've already overcome those issues and, and reached that milestone here. So we're really proud of staff and, and their effort to get this, this new plan through. 
Um, just a couple other ones there. Um, talked about a couple new studies that are going on. Uh, the last second to last bullet there, the Smart Communities Toolbox. We think that's going to be very helpful for uh, municipalities and, and members in our region to get them uh, some ideas, to give them some ideas about uh, how to become a smart city or a smart town or a smart village. Um, trying to, we're implementing our, 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 we're also trying to implement our trails plan. That's the last bullet there. Um, something of highlight, give Albany County a little shout out there is Albany County. We have a contract with Albany County and we've had had the contract with Albany County for services for many years. And as part of that uh, services contract, Albany County asked us to look at the feasibility of a loop trail that they want to develop on uh, State Route uh, 155. So i um, really happy to help uh, Albany County uh, with that project and actually uh, be, be paid for it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the other things there, I mean, the bullet in the middle is is a freight study. Appreciate everybody's input on developing um, the scope for the new freight study. That's that's starting out now. We have a we have a uh, study advisory committee that's meeting soon. And I think this will be really helpful for the region because truck parking is an issue everywhere. Uh, and it's something that we'll be able to look at more detailed and, and come up with some really, I think, constructive recommendations there. And the last couple of bullets talk about uh, linkage studies. I think you're all very familiar with our linkage studies program and what was approved last month. And then the last bullet there is our ambassador program, which we call mini grants here, but really effective. And we really get, you know, really reach a lot of um, great small agencies when it comes to helping them improve bicycle and pedestrian safety. So that's a very quick summary of the full uh, progress report. We do need a motion to approve before we send this to our federal partners. Any questions? Looks good. Thank you, Mike. Any final questions before we vote? Good report. Motion to adopt the updated unified planning work program item six. Motion, support. motion please. Motion. Andrew moves and a second by. <laughs> Who's that? Second, all right, I'll second it then. All right, Steve Iacata seconding. And all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstaining or opposed, speak now and once, going twice. UPWP is hereby adopted. Item six on our agenda. No, that, let's see, there's two number sixes on my agenda. How can that be? Next up are discussion items. I believe we've got tip application and evaluation update and Sandy Miswitz will give us a brief overview. Andy, are you ready? Morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, so this <clears throat> document in your um, packet provides an update of the basically where staff is at in the application and evaluation update of our TIP procedures um, for new projects. So um, web-based application, you know, we're at a point where we're in development of the new web-based application. Um, we have decided to use JotForm uh, for the web-based application. We're in the midst of testing and we're hoping to bring to the planning committee in July um, basically a overview of where we're at with the application. Um, our group is also, the web-based uh, application group has also uh, been working on the preservation discussion paper, which we'll get into um, in a little bit. Um, the merit evaluation score sheet, if you haven't submitted comments and you would like to comment on the merit score sheet presented at our last meeting, um, please send in your comments. Uh, we will be revising it and bringing it to you for approval um, at the July meeting. And we're still working internally on our evaluation data management, um, which is somewhat hinged on how we develop the application um, and the output that comes from the web-based application. Um, and we'll be able to talk more about that at the July meeting. So remaining schedule, obviously we have a policy board meeting in June. Uh, we will be briefing the policy board on where we're at and gathering input. July, again, we will hope to finalize the merit score sheet, get that approved um, and recommend policy board approval for that. 
Uh, we'll continue likely the discussion on the preservation uh, discussion paper. Um, and then we will start reviewing the project application and other, other data tools. Um, continue that through August and then September we'll bring everything to policy board for final approval. Um, any questions about that? Thank you, Sandy. Good overview. Our next planning meeting is on the 7th of July after the policy board, June 3rd. Any questions of the overview? We're following the schedule as previously established. And thank you for the overview, Sandy. Um, ready to move forward, Mike? Um, let's see. This said definitions of preservation and beyond preservation projects. Do we cover that? Yeah, we'd like to cover that. That's also part of the uh, TIP application evaluation update. And I shared uh, the, the uh, summary that's in your package. Uh, this is kind of an important issue for us. And, you know, we've worked with DOT and staff uh, to come up with this uh, new uh, this new discussion paper. Um, so I'm going to let Sandy talk more about it in detail, please. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, so as has been discussed at previous uh, planning committee meetings and as we saw in uh, recent TIP updates, um, the definitions for what is considered a preservation versus a beyond preservation project is often unclear. Um, and so what we've tried to do um, based on a couple of things, one, we have a new, tr new regional transportation plan that of course emphasizes uh, maintenance and, and other types of projects as priorities in our long range plan. Um, NISDOT has since adopted a transportation asset management plan um, that outlines sort of the department's view on how they're uh, approaching asset management. Um, and then a few other things that, you know, we have found as staff as we evaluate projects that we feel like needs to be clarified for our sponsors of transportation improvement program projects. So this paper is again, intended for discussion, but it's trying to outline some definitions of what constitutes a preservation project in, high, in general terms, um, what constitutes a beyond preservation project, how ADA accessibility feeds into um, this because there's certain regulations and rules and requirements for ADA. And then we try to outline, um, generally speaking, mode isn't really the right term, but asset type. Um, so pavement, bridge, sidewalks, shared use trails, complete streets, um, and try to give some parameters uh, for what would be generally defined as a preservation project and what would generally be considered a beyond preservation project. Why is this important? Um, for CDTC's purposes, when we evaluate projects in the TIP, we organize the projects in a way that you're trying to compare as best we can apples to apples. So we're not comparing a bridge replacement project directly with an element specific bridge repair. Um, so it's important for us to define how each of those categories and what kind of projects fit into those categories. Um, so for example, I'll walk through the payment example. Um, for basic pavement preservation projects, what we're, we'd like to discuss with the group is how we're going to define not only the pavement treatment types selected, but sort of the additional project elements that are often included in pavement preservation projects, such as work on sidewalks. Um, so one of the things that we, we recognize is that there's multiple ways you can preserve the pavement. There are um, preventative treatments, there are corrective treatments that range, you know, from very basic single course overlays to more uh, what we'll call thicker uh, pavement overlays. Um, within both of these, you'd have to still do your ADA and meet your ADA compliance. Um, but the threshold at which something goes beyond that into a beyond preservation is one in which you would be completely reconstructing your pavement and or exceeding um, a sidewalk replacement of more than 2,600 uh, linear feet or basically half a mile of, of sidewalk. So what we, one of the reasons we opted to select this threshold value for sidewalk replacement 
is we saw in the last TIP update wide ranging values uh, within a payment preservation project of how much sidewalk was being rebuilt. Um, in some cases, it may be a thousand linear feet, which would indicate to us um, that individual slabs might need replacing, or there might be some specific sections of sidewalk that need replacing. But we also saw similar applications where the payment preservation, the payment treatment type was a preservation treatment, but the sidewalk piece was a full replacement of 14,000 linear feet of sidewalk. And so, you know, to better categorize these projects, those were the sort of things that we were trying to provide some definition on. Um, I can go through this in more detail. I hope you read it in advance of the meeting. I know there's a lot here. Um, we can uh, take it, you know, asset class by asset class or take some general questions, but that's the spirit of what we're trying to do with this, with this document. And ultimately, we would make this information available to all project sponsors applying for TIP projects um, to use as a, as a basic guideline for where your project might fit in. Um, and, you know, more and more um, things, the, the definition of preservation is, is, is loose, uh, particularly for local government um, sponsors. I think DOT has some additional requirements internally that, um, put more restrictions on the types of projects that are uh, considered preservation or beyond, but uh, there's a little more flexibility there for local sponsors. So that's a very high level overview. If you'd like me to get into this in more detail, I'm happy to do so, um, but I'll pass it back to Mike for discussion. Yeah, if you can remember, thank you very much, Sandy. If you can remember uh, two tip updates ago, um, we actually were uh, asked by DOT to meet a goal of a certain percentage of, pre of preservation projects. Um, and in the last tip update, that was not the case, um, despite the fact that the uh, state required their own, um, had, had their own goals for a percentage of uh, preservation projects that was not applied to local projects. So we do have that flexibility to discern, you know, determine how many of our projects are preservation versus beyond preservation, which I think is good. And that's still, that, that's still maintained. Um, as Sandy said, we're really just trying to make sure you, the members understand, you know, where your cat, where your project is going to be in the, in the category of projects. Uh, we're not looking for any action here. We're just looking for discussion and recommendations. Mike, can I ask you a question for you and Sandy on this then? Absolutely. All right, Sandy, you had alluded to a um, local level having different advantage as far as what a preservation is. And then, of course, DOT is looking at this, and now we're looking. Are, are you looking to sort of our consolidate or create an amalgamation of, of all understanding so that as we go into the tip update that there are you looking to say okay there won't there shouldn't be any questions then and I think that's our objective I think that what we would like to do is have CDTC defined categories for preservation and beyond so that when we get into the TIP update we don't 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 spend a lot of time debating the placement of a project in one category versus the other um, I don't know that we've done a great job of that in the past, and largely because this is new information, it continues to evolve. It may change again, even as we enter this tip update. So the other thing I would I would point out is even this draft document is subject to change based on new information coming from the federal government or even from the state DOT um, with different uh, changes in policies. Um, but with that, that's really our goal is, is simply to make sure that the, as it, within the CDTC TIP update process, we have some, some clear guidance in terms of how we're defining these project types. Is the department on board with where you're headed, with where the, where the committee is headed on this? Thing? Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you, know, I, you know, I speak to that, Mike. I, you know, I really appreciated both, you know, Mike and Sandy's reaching out about this. I, I think it's important that we sort of set a framework for what is a preservation project versus a beyond preservation project prior to when we're actually talking about individual mm -hmm. projects. You know, it, it gets very specific and personal when we're looking at candidates and, and trying to compare. Right. I think that, you know, the setting of this framework 
to then let us go back to it when we have an actual proposed project to then say it's, it's, it's a preservation or it's clearly beyond that sort of scope rather than make it so personalized when we mm -hmm. get into the, the tip discussion. Okay. And no, I, I mean, we, we, you know, we certainly support that. I, I mean, the, the, the projects that DOT proposes, you know, by our own mandates are preservation in nature. Uh, you know, the region doesn't have the discretion really to program stuff beyond that without without uh, even internal competitive selection processes for beyond preservation type work. So, I mean, all the candidates that, that we're proposing are, are under that umbrella. And, and I just, from the experience last time around, I think it's good to have this definition debate prior to it than when we're actually talking about the ownership that somebody feels towards a particular project and having the debate at that point. So no, I, I certainly appreciate these efforts uh, and, and the conversation we had about this. So are, have we moved completely away from 83% for one time and then nothing the next time? As far as programming yeah. amounts that we're going to present for, the, for the locals, we believe so. We, we believe it's gonna be like the last hip update where there was not a mandated target for locals. The DOT program is still, we have internal mandates mm -hmm. on the DOT program, but not the local. Okay. So we're trying to maintain flexibility in that realm for everyone else. And we do think it's important that the body has, uh, you know, the privy to put the scope of projects that they want to put there balanced against other needs. But, you know, I, I, I think even, you know, from our long term planning processes, as well as department policies, we, I, we're collectively understand we need to put a, a good chunk towards preservation of the higher functional class roads, regardless of the ownership. And, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you want to balance that against other sort of critical investments that that the body want to make. So I, I think it helps to define these up front as opposed to, you know, well, difficult. Well, I've got one, This these folks got two projects. I only got one, but that one costs double this one. You know, I, I, if, if we have some sort of litmus test of, of what the, the scope of these are prior to even going into the act, actual project discussion, I, I you know, I, I do think that's a, a useful resource. Andy, I'm going to go through the, the notes, I guess, a little bit more. The only thing I would think is that we have our Broadway project. It's not as extensive as what you're determining with a 14,000 feet of sidewalk, but we have sidewalk replacement in our pavement preservation project uh, where we have issues with certain sections of it. So I would think that, you know, like anything else, these preservation techniques, and I'll turn my camera on so everyone say hi, um, would be that, uh, that you know, the, the difference like always we have between urban and rural you know when you come into the cities you have all the ada requirements you have the sidewalks you have all these things that we want to get but then at the same point you go into the counties and you, you just open it up to all these different kind of treatments and you don't have the sidewalks so i mean i i personally i've been gravitating more towards the bridge preservation but now with bridge new york i've been using that program so maybe i'll have to come back to the pavement just because the requirements with a pavement preservation project are, they're, they're, they're so much higher. I prefer to do it with chips, but um, I, I just, I'll go through it a little bit more, but yeah, to, to eliminate the sidewalks, that, that I thought was a nice addition, even though we didn't go in and do the whole road, that would have been, yeah, that would have been a lot of money too, where your, your pavement money and your sidewalk money are or maybe even flipped. So I can see how that would be a little odd. Right, and so you know, we are definitely welcoming any feedback you folks have on the on the dis, on the on the discussion paper. Um, again, we we picked a half mile of sidewalk replacement as qualifying for preservation. We thought that was a reasonable number to start with. If there's you know discussion amongst the group that that might not be the best figure, we can talk about that. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, any feedback is in. Is welcome and we'll be revising this. Um, we'll also be reorganizing it so I think it'll be a little easier to read the next time you see it. Um, 
such that uh, we'll be taught, you know, kind of finalizing it for the July uh, planning committee meeting. Okay. Good discussion. Any, uh, anything to point out on the table? It's a nice table, pavement work type categories. Last page of the discussion paper, uh, preventive and corrective maintenance, uh, rehab, or reconstruction are all spelled out on the table. So that's helpful as well. Thanks for the DOT um, concurrence and guidance, Bob and Greg. Um, Anything further on this planning tool to help us move forward? Uh, we can move on to the next agenda item. If not. Anything else? Closing remarks? Yeah, there's the table. Uh, nope. I'll just say, you know, please submit your comments to Mike, um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Sandy. Excellent. Yeah, th this is a very positive um, cooperative step. Next item up is the CTC regional project delivery update. And Jacob Beeman is ready to give us a quick overview as a, another planning tool status of activities as of May 1st. Yep, thanks Steve. Um, so we only had one uh, kind of project milestone hit um, based on our consultant updates that we received in the past month. Uh, we've got the City of Schenectady Broadway Mill and Fill project. Uh, PSE was submitted uh, back in March. Um, going over the updates I'll be sending out next month, uh, I'll be reaching out to the City of Albany, Town of Sand Lake, Town of Glenville, and the Town of North Greenbush uh, to be asking for updates on their active tip projects. So, uh, for any of you from those uh, municipalities on the call today, keep an eye out for that email. Um, and uh, I've got John Scavo on from Clifton Park, and he's going to be uh, giving a brief update on their pedestrian safety action plan project uh, that's looking to go out uh, for construction this summer. John? Yes, thank you, Jacob. Uh, we have nine intersections, uh, five signalized, four unsignalized that we uh, did design drawings on. It's currently out to, to bid now. Uh, bids are due May 18th. We anticipate awarding the construction contract in June with construction to occur July, August, and wrap up hopefully in September. I'll just give an example. Clifton Park Center and Fisher Ferry Road, we have four existing crosswalks at that signal. The intersection's going to be upgraded to high visibility, high intensity crosswalks. The approach crosswalk uh, is currently located away from the intersection to the north and will be relocated closer to the intersection in a location that makes most sense for pedestrians and drivers. Um, in addition to that, we're also putting RRFBs in where possible uh, to with uh, mid-block crossings to enhance uh, safety for pedestrians by the Shenandoah School District entrance on Clifton Park Center Road. We have uh, yellow beacons that constantly flash 24 seven. And what we've noticed is over the last 10 years, drivers have become immune to those flashing beacons and the RRFBs are much more uh, attention grabbing for drivers and uh, give a better sense of visibility of pedestrians and cyclists. So we are upgrading that intersection. Uh, we are, Basically on target with our timeline, there was some cost overruns uh, with some minor right-of-way acquisitions and a few months delay. We're still on target though uh, for construction this summer, but any cost overruns uh, were picked up locally by the municipality. That's basically it. Thanks, John. Always appreciate uh, the detailed updates. Um, uh, just one final update. I guess I always want to point out that our uh, local project tracking spreadsheet is uploaded uh, each month as part of the uh, planning committee meeting materials. So I want to encourage everyone, uh, whether you're project sponsor or consultant, um, always go take a look at that. And we're always happy to um, get updates uh, from anyone working on projects. You know, each each month we uh, kind of reach out to our handful of project sponsors, but uh, we're always happy to get kind of uh, intermittent updates from consultants and sponsors in, in between uh, kind of our official outreach. So that's all I've got, Steve. Thank you, Jacob. 
Thank you. Good planners tool, appreciate that. Next up is the DOT project delivery schedule available at the meeting. Do we have anything, Bob or Greg? Bob? No, Steve, I, I think uh, the last time at the meeting, we, we passed out the 21-22 program, both the local and state, and it, there haven't been any changes since last time. So Great. unless Thanks. folks have a question. Uh, any questions for Bob right. at this time? Going once, going twice. Uh, that's a wrap. Next item, 10 status of CDTC planning activities. These are uh, four staff reports. First up, item uh, 10A is Sandy on the CDTC Regional Planning Commission Technical Assistance Program. Sandy? Thanks, Steve. Um, so here's my camera. Um, since we started the technical assistance program, we have funded 18 projects. So we've made a lot of progress and worked with a lot of different um, local governments. Um, in the 2020 year, we funded eight projects. Um, four have been completed and four are uh, still in process being wrapped up. Um, I'll go through the four that remain open. Um, the first is in the town of Colony. Uh, related to enhanced development regulations where the town was looking at um, reviewing electric vehicle zoning best practices and guidance um, for how to integrate that into um, their parking regulations. Also, they were looking at stormwater management, landscaping and site design um, concepts, as well as a green area ratio. Um, white papers have been completed on most of those subjects um, and are currently under review uh, by the town. And we expect this project to be wrapped up uh, probably by the end of the month of May. Um, the second project that's still uh, in process, progress is the uh, with the city of Troy regional growth and infrastructure capacity analysis in which um, the city of Troy, uh, which in, has the sewer system for sort of a, a larger area than just the city of Troy itself. It extends into Brunswick and some of the surrounding uh, communities is, is reached capacity. Um, so there's a, the study is intended to look at growth scenarios um, and see what pressure is going to be put on the public sewer system and the, um, the main sewer um, treatment plant and what long-term plans need to be made um, to, to address those issues. So that project is ongoing at the same time. Uh, we're in the context of um, the growth in that area. We're also looking at the pressure on Route 7, Hoosick Street, um, under the same growth scenarios. Next project um, is in the village of Boston Spa. Uh, the village is um, in the process of updating their comprehensive plan. Uh, they requested it and are receiving assistance for some guidance on developing an RFP for consultants assistance on that project, um, as well as uh, developing a, an existing conditions report um, prior to moving forward on the comprehensive plan. So getting some of the tasks done uh, in advance of the, uh, the broader comprehensive planning process. Uh, and that project is expected to be completed by the end of, well, it said end of April, I'm, I'm guessing into, into the month of May here, it should be finished. And then the final project um, is Hoffman Hill Road Safety Analysis in the town of Glenville. Um, this is a, a rural road in the town in which um, a nearby road was closed due to flood, uh, flood impacts. Um, the road is not really designed and was never intended for uh, the kind of use it's seeing. Although traffic is low, um, it has very, very steep grades. It's had some safety problems. So we provided some uh, technical assistance, developed a safety analysis technical, technical memorandum, um, and worked with the town uh, to complete and identify some recommendations uh, for future implementation there, uh, largely along the lines of signs um, lane striping, these sorts of things, some low cost improvements. So that's where we're at with the technical assistance program. I'll mention that the 2021 program is open for applications. So um, if you would like to apply or be considered to apply, feel free to reach out to me or to Mark at techassistance at cdrpc.org. Um, and we'll, we'll be happy to chat with you about that.
You, okay, thanks, Sandy. Excellent overview. Any questions for Sandy on the TAP? Technical assistance program, small but very important and uh, similar to linkage serves as a great launch pad for, uh, for other projects. Next up is the Patroon Creek Greenway and Jen Saponis can guide us on this. Jen? Sure, so the Patroon Creek Greenway feasibility study is part of the implementation of the Capital District Trails Plan. We are um, working with the city of Albany and have just contracted with the consultant team consisting of Bergman Associates with Land Art Studios. And the objective of this study is to identify a feasible alignment from the Albany Skyway, which is currently being constructed, to the six mile waterworks at the western edge of the city. So it would be an east west trail corridor um, that is adjacent to the I 90 corridor. As you all probably know, the Patroon Creek Greenway has been a key trail project. It's part of, been part of um, New Vision since New Vision's 2030 and as part of the Capital District Trails Plan. So um, we are about to kick that off and we will keep everyone updated as, as it progresses. Very exciting. Thank you, Jen. Any questions for Jen on the Greenway and the Capital District Trails? Um, focus on Patroon Creek West. Next up is the bus lane feasibility study. Sandy Miswitz again. Sandy? Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, so quick update. Uh, we had a solicitation for um, consultants to work on the bus lane feasibility study. We received five proposals. Uh, we interviewed three teams um, and we have made a selection. Uh, we're in contract negotiations at the moment, so, so I can't get into um, who we selected, but um, we anticipate the announcement to come fairly soon. And uh, we hope to start work on this um, in sometime in the month of June. So for many uh, members of the planning committee, um, there'll be a lot of you who will likely be reaching out to to be a part of the study advisory committee. Um, and also we're very interested in a robust public uh, participation process for this project. Um, so stay tuned for more information. Good heads up. Thanks, Andy. And lastly, item uh, 10D is the New Visions 2050 virtual learning series with virtual local government training. And Jen's opponents will guide us. Jen? Sure. Um, so the New Visions virtual learning series is a monthly webinar. Um, the third Tuesday of every month we have a webinar. The next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, May 18th at 3.30. And because it's bike month, we will be focusing on bike planning in the Capital District. We have, um, we'll have an overview of bike safety trends from uh, presented by Sandy, the city of Troy will provide a brief overview of their ongoing activities. And then Andy Beers will talk about the Empire State Trail and what's next for statewide trail planning. Um, again, that's Tuesday, May 18th. And then beginning in June, we're gonna start a three-part Complete Streets webinar series that will um, span from obstacles to Complete Streets to how to implement a demonstration project um, to open streets types of projects. So. All of the webinars have been recorded and shared on the CDTC YouTube um, channel, which I did paste the, a link to in the chat um, and upcoming webinars and information about them can be found on the CDTC website. Also, um, just as a reminder, if your local government would like um, a virtual training and we can talk and tailor it to what you're looking for, whether it's complete streets, or land use or infrastructure, um, planning board, zoning board, town board, city council, um, definitely let me know and I'd be happy to, to schedule one. We do have um, an upcoming virtual um, training with Saratoga later this month. So um, please feel free to reach out. Excellent, thanks, Jen. Yeah, this YouTube looks interesting. Will you send a... Um a brief email reminder just prior to these uh, webinars to the members so can, of the committee. We can do that. That'd be helpful to me. <laughs> thank you and others, I'm sure. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions? Uh, we can move forward. And the status of member planning activities. Uh, first up, item 11A is the Regional Planning Commission. Is Mark on? Or anyone from CDR PC? I don't see him. Okay, we can move to the next. Um, Mark, Mark, yeah, Mike, 
uh, Mark did have a conflict and he had to leave during the meeting. Okay, thank you, Michael. All right, so no one from regional at this time. Um, CTA, Ross? Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, you'd asked about ridership. Um, so the, the, the roller coaster does continue, uh, but in a good direction. Uh, now we're heading uh, back up, slow and steady. Um, from, I was telling you, what previous falls is roughly 55,000 uh, per weekday, uh, rides per weekday before the pandemic. Um, we had dropped down considerably lower. And at the end of January, we were uh, just below probably 27, 28,000 per year. Uh, but in that couple months since then, uh, in the last uh, few weeks, we've been uh, just below 35,000. So we're so we're, we're inching upward, which is very good. Um, obviously, that's due to just the reopening of the region you know, that's occurring. Um, so it's a, a very positive trend. Uh, we hope that continues. Um, the, the last piece I, I was discussing uh, before with the, the airport presentation is, you know, and I'll, I'll speak with, with Sandy and, and Mike after this, is, you know, what, what is it that the region can do with all of the new legislation or federal federal funding for transportation that are coming out. What can we do to think about how to encourage uh, the increase in, in travel to the to the region, you know, like the air or you know, obviously we're gonna push more for even more uh, uh, rail traffic. Um, but how do we make the region better connected to the Northeast, but also North America is just something we should collectively uh, speak about. Um, but that's for another day, uh, and that's my update. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Any questions on the CTA front? <clears throat> questions moving forward. Item 11, Charlie is DOT. Bob? Hey, th thanks, Steve. Uh, a few items. Uh, we've had a couple lettings since we last got together. Uh, Route 4 at I-90 at, in East Greenbush, uh, the estimate was 4.9 million. The low bid came in at 4.1 million. Uh, I-90 paving, exit 10 to the throughway, uh, the low bid came in at 4.7 million versus a 5.4 million estimate. Uh, we also, Greg mentioned the, uh, the bridge, the element specific project. That was a little bit higher with the low bid at 7.2 versus a budget of 6.3. Uh, but uh, we're still not sure about the award of that job because, as he, as he said, some Sitterly Road is one of the sites in there. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. I, uh, I did want to mention we had sort of an influx of, of payment requests that had come in in the first quarter of this year. Uh, be between that and a conversion to the new the SFS, the statewide financial system, that there has been some growing pains uh, with that and getting the processing of some payment requests. So we're sort of assigning more resources to that and you know, working with the sponsors as themselves have issues with dealing with the new system here. And so, so folks know we're on that and uh, it, getting folks paid is a priority and, and we're, pu we're putting the resources and the team there to get in line with the new with the new financial system. Uh, when it, last week was the work zone awareness week and I, I think it may be you know, anecdotal at this point, but I, I think folks became a little used to not a lot of traffic on the roads and the speeds seem to have increased. Uh, utilizing the Operation Hard Hat where state troopers are disguised in, in DOT hard hats and vest. I mean, hundreds of tickets were written last week across the state within the work zones, including in, here in the Capital District. Uh, we had an unfortunate incident where one of our Saratoga County employees was picking up cones and uh, was hit where two vehicles collided, sort of racing in the work zone and uh, looking at broken vertebrae and, and back and leg issues. and. Uh, lengthy stay in the hospital. And I don't know if our friends from the throughway are on. I mean, they, they had a, a horrific sort of incident related a couple of weeks ago in Schenectady that, that certainly could have been fatal. So 
anything to get that message out between our own staffs as well as the public uh, you know, you know, temper the speed a little bit out there. Hey, thank you, Bob. Any uh, questions on the DOT front? No, I'm not done yet, Steve. Come on. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> Go ahead. Take all the time you like. Uh, I've had a couple inquiries. They, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of Amtrak service and, uh, you know, some media push about the expansion of service. I, I reached out to our folks that deal with Amtrak and uh, I, I at least wanted to, to give an update. Uh, currently about half of the the operation, Amtrak operation in, in New York is subsidized by DOT and currently COVID related, still only about half of those uh, trains are running. And, and uh, in particular related to the, the Ethan Allen, the, the service to Rutland, that it is going to be restored to full service starting July the 16th after its, its sort of COVID pause. Uh, and there is some discussion related to the expansion of that service all the way up to to Burlington, Vermont. And the Vermont DOT sort of have the lead on that piece. And there's not an impact as it relates to Albany South to the city, but that would impact the schedules around the Port Edward, Saratoga, Schenectady and Albany in terms of the timetables of when those arrivals would may, may happen. But uh, the restoration at service is set for July and, and this expansion discussion is into 2022. Uh, currently the Adirondack service at the Montreal and the Maple Leaf to Toronto, those currently remain suspended because of the border crossings. And uh, currently not impacting the service to New York between New York and Albany, but it's sort of west and north of there. So I thought it was important to bring out those up uh, we're finalizing the scope of services for the Troy Manan study. I've, I've had a few inquiries. Uh, essentially, it is under the Pell Planning Environmental Linkage umbrella. But it's it's going to be more geared as a as a scoping study. We're trying to pinpoint, you know, the the public input, the environmental and social considerations that would impact where the current crossing or, or a future crossing and then sort of getting into the higher level regional network model of what the implications would be uh, for a, a new crossing or improved current area crossing. So we hope to have, uh, I said, we've worked with Federal Highway, we hope to have that scope out on the street by, by the end of the month-ish. Bob, this is Andrew. Uh, yeah. I would imagine that the environmental is going to be percentage-wise, a much larger issue on that scoping than the impact to residential just due to the location and what's there. Can you speak a little bit more as far as what the focus might end up being that guides the ultimate decision on that? Yeah, you know, Andrew, I, I mean, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, really, this is just a first cut at those sort of things to identify exactly what you're talking about, the things that may need uh, subsequent studies going forward. We're, we're really just trying to get at things that have a, a shelf life that would not, you know, that the clock doesn't start ticking now. A lot of time we get into the NEPA process and the environmental clock of you know, any finding you had is, is only got a shelf life of three years here. We're trying to, you know, identify either, uh, you know, uh, uh, Native American species, sort of other sort of within that entire corridor. It's almost not even about the bridge. It's really about the corridor uh, study area and you know hot spots where uh, there would be major impediments to a new alignment. So Understood. you know, I mean, the like you Europe. said, the archaeological because from the South Troy Roadway uh, past scoping this considerations you know we ran into that whole issue with the Stockbridge Muncie that yeah really impacted things so I'm assuming that that being an area of potential effect is is going to be back on the table and, and certainly when you narrow down in, into a manageable series of alternatives that would be this, this subsequent you know more specific site specific whether we're looking at traffic at a particular intersection or 
like you said, the environmental considerations around a particular location. Those would be subsequent studies, but those, those then really begin the clock relative to uh, your environmental determination being, being uh, ap timely and applicable under NEPA. So we're trying to get sort of everything done prior to that that would be helpful going into that kind of look just to when we finally uh, uh, you know the resources to undertake a design phase on on something of this magnitude that that we've got input that still has shelf life yeah uh, the last thing I, I just you know worth mentioning and we're still anticipating uh, you know a, a federal transportation bill at some point but you know the see the news, there, there's a wide gap between the House and the Senate sort of versions here. So that, that plays certainly into uh, the tap CMAC solicitation or, or, you know, uh, or even, you know, the tip update in a, in a broader sense for, for upcoming, but uh, hopefully we'll keep that, di see that dialogue continue and, and get some movement there. So that's it, Steve. That's, Thanks for the rail update, Bob. That's, that's uh, some good input. Uh, next up, Tim, Tim Wainwright is with the Thruway Authority. Tim, are you, can you give us a Thruway update? Uh, sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, on the capital side, uh, no real updates from our last meeting. Um, but I do want to kind of add on to what Bob was talking about with just the, the dangers that our guys and men and women face on a daily basis out on the road. You know, we participated in the Operation Hardhead as well. Uh, and as, as Bob mentioned, you know, we did have an incident uh, where we were actually doing a left-hand lane closure and we had a vehicle come down the left-hand side of our, of our trucks between the, uh, on the shoulder between our trucks and the guide rail. Uh, fortunately for us, um, you know, we didn't have the same level of injuries that Bob described. Uh, so we were, we were lucky there, but, um, but yeah, it is, uh, dangers that our folks face every every day so thanks for bringing that up Bob. that was all i had thank you tim any questions on the throughway front smooth ride uh, next up is the Oldman county airport authority uh, we were well covered in the uh, presentation today thanks for your interest in that so we're advancing environmental nepa and seeker for some uh Terminal front entrance and security checkpoint expansion, also a 50,000 square foot hangar. Um, it's kind of scoping at this point, but it's environmental studies. We want to have a good palette of shovel ready projects for development. This year, we're really doing preservation type on our uh, air side with a full 8,500 foot length new taxiway, alpha primary taxiway, and uh, the master plan is another study. We're wrapping up a few other uh, air side. Uh, lighting conversions were almost all LED now, a nice energy efficiency project there. I mentioned our new electric vehicle stations. Uh, we're going touchless elevator buttons at all 19 elevator locations. We got about 55 buildings, so we cover a lot of, a lot of improvements that way with both uh, energy efficiency and so on. Any questions on the airport front, I'd be happy to answer or call me offline anytime. Uh, next up is Tony Vassell, Port District Commission. Tony, you still there? Yes, still here, folks. Hang it in. Thank you, Steve, and good morning, all. Uh, well, at the Port of Albany and Rensselaer uh, through April this year versus last year, our ships and barges are about the same. Our tonnage is up to around 15 or 20 percent. And one of our major measurements is the total number of hours our longshoremen work in uh, loading and discharging. Uh, uh, vessels and handling trucks and rail cars. And last year, the total was around 12,000. This year, it's 20,000 hours, increase of 8,066%. So uh, that's a very positive sign. Also, another thing, you know, which is blowing in the wind, which you probably see in the newspapers, and everything is offshore wind. Uh, we uh, will be, uh, worried this year, design of the facility in 2021 of the operations and also clearing the 83 acres in Bethlehem that uh, the facility will stand on. Then the construction will begin in 2022 and uh, production probably in 2024. 
Uh, jumping on to the last topic, uh, we're not a container port, but what's going on in, our, in, our, in, a, in the international and domestic scene, uh, logistically and supply chain, you've probably seen their price increases. Uh, that's primarily because a container used to cost $1,500 to move from China to the US. Now it's $6,000. And I was speaking to a manager who was happy to pay the 6000 and get space on a ship. So this impacts lumber. This Im it's going to impact uh, all the products like uh, toilet paper, uh, pampers, and everything like that. Uh, so uh, that will definitely have an impact. And what's going on is the supply chain is tight. At the West Coast, there's 15 ships sitting outside waiting for discharge. On the East Coast, nothing like that. But still, yet there are major problems or difficulties, uh, shortages of containers, shortages of the chassis to put the containers on, and also drivers. So we anticipate this to continue, the supply chain disruption through the third quarter of this year. So give you an overview of what's going on at the port. Thank you very much, Tony. It's fascinating. Um, it's very exciting about the new uh, wind turbine development. They're uh, going to be manufacturing uh, wind turbine. Actually, towers. Towers. Towers, yes. And those towers uh, will be built, uh, building a dock that will, like right now, we have the dock is 1,200 pounds a square foot load capacity. It will be 6,000 pounds a square foot. And those towers will move down on a ship or a barge down to uh, two facilities off of Long Island. Excellent. Any other questions for Tony? It's a great update. Thank you, Tony. Exciting times. Uh, let's see, local planning activities. Are there any uh, municipal reps that would like to chime in at this time um, and highlight a key uh, planning development? Any county, city, town, good opportunity. I know there's a lot going on, a lot of recovery in progress. Once or twice, our last item is the upcoming meetings. On May 11th is the Bike Pet Advisory Committee. May 19th is the Freight Advisory. June 3rd is the Full Policy Board. And then our next meeting of this planning committee is July 7th. And Michael will still be with us, Mike. On the seventh, any uh, closing yes, remarks? I, yes, I will still be there. I was <laughs> muted. We throw a party for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wonder if you were ascending to heaven the way it sounded. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Don't know. Great book on transportation history in America. <laughs> All right, motion to adjourn. Any any new items or old item, old business? You can. Motion adjourned. Thank you for your participation, everyone. Good meeting. Pushing it forward. Be healthy. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye. 11:45. All right, we did.